York's very own muscle building coaches, Anthony Bevilacqua and Pete Kacharian, proudly present to you New York Muscle Radio. What's up, guys? The 12 Days of Fitness Podcast. We're bringing back all the classic episodes we've ever done. In today's episode, we have a great one lined up. We're talking about RPEs with Mike to share. New York Muscle Radio is flooding your podcast feed. It's your host, Anthony Bevilacqua, alongside my co-host, Big Pikachu. And if you're a new listener, welcome to the best muscle building radio show ever. The big guy, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, we have our third co-host here today, Dominic the Donkey, and he's uh, he's celebrating the 12 days of Christmas with us. It's day nine, dude. I know, man. And it's been, like we said on the uh, couple podcasts ago, Christmas is just... It's right around the corner, and it's coming by really, really fast. I know. We got a treat for you guys lined up on the 12th day of Christmas, so you guys got to be ready for that one, and when that one comes out, you have to really, really... That one's going to be great. I'm excited for the 12th day. Yeah, make sure everybody who is uh, celebrating Christmas to uh, allow New York Muscle Radio to celebrate Christmas with you guys. So uh, when you go start uh, opening those presents, make sure you download some New York Muscle Radio podcasts. (laughs) Yeah, specifically the day 12. Man, three days. Can you believe that? Coming up. So what did you uh what's on your what did you ask Santa for this year? Anything good? I always buy myself what I need. So I don't need anything as far as gifts go, you know? Uh I, every time I need something for the gym, I buy it. Uh if I need clothes or whatever, I'll buy it. Like I'm a horrible person to get gifts for. I do want a like a Giants jersey, like little stuff like that that I kind of won't buy myself, you know? Yeah, and as far as the stuff with the gym, I mean, do did we, did we talk about the uh, the new upgrades you've been training with lately? You have some pretty unique equipment that we've been using. Well, no, but you can go ahead and explain. <laughs> well, I mean, you would probably be better than me. I mean, the one main thing that we have been doing, you've, you've actually had this a little while, but I don't think we've spoken about it, is uh, we've been using that Buffalo bar like exclusively on uh, all our squatting and all our benching, you know, and it's uh, definitely a good tool, I think, that's going to help us both increase the, uh, the bench and the squat. I've, I know I've been feeling it, definitely. Yeah, the reason why I like the the reason why I've been using the Buffalo Bar is because um, my tendonitis and my elbow was really flaring up the last training block, and um, you know with the regular barbell you're limited to the range of motion. So especially with low bar, it's a lot on the elbow and on the wrist and whatnot. So when you use it like a Buffalo Bar, uh, it's basically a bent bar for those of you that don't know, but it's thicker and it's heavier. So it's a 55 pound bar. Um, it's also round, like I said, in shape. It's bent. So when you have your hands on it, it's it almost puts the bar in more of a high bar position, so it's a lot more comfortable on the hands and the wrist and elbow and stuff. Yeah, it's one of those things where um, for squats, I guess if you're comfortable using it, it's you're not. Re- I don't really feel like I notice too much of a difference comparing it to a uh, straight bar, but on bench, there's a significant difference, you know, because then you're going to get additional range of motion on the bench, and uh, you know that's something where uh, dumbbells definitely have. You know, they're a little bit superior to a barbell. Now, with a buffalo bar, it's almost like you're doing a dumbbell press with a barbell. So you kind of get the b- best of both worlds. Uh, definitely a little harder, though, too, because you're going to be using a thicker bar and a greater range of motion. But I, I like it so far. I think it's a good uh, it's a good tool. We've been doing that plus a lot of uh, a lot of banded stuff lately. We're making, making all the exercises a little more difficult, which is uh, definitely a change of pace. But I'm, I'm enjoying it lately. Definitely, it's, a, it's good to change it up a little bit. Yeah, one of the things that I don't like with the Buffalo Bar benching is just I think it's too much range of motion for my shoulders, and because uh, you're definitely you're you're adding about three inches of you know to the bar, and uh, I don't know for me I don't like it so much for bench. So we've just recently swapped that out. So we'll be doing, using straight bar for that. But um, as far as the squats go, and you you didn't know this yet, you won't experience it until you actually use a straight bar. But when you switch back to a straight bar, I think because the straight bar is thinner. And obviously, it's 45 pounds instead of 55. Even with the same weight, it just feels totally different on your back. It feels so much lighter because the buffalo bar is really thick and heavy. So I don't know. When you switch back to the regular bar, you're like, whoa, this is light. And you'll see, like, you'll actually be able to feel the whip of the bar. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I will. And it's one of those things like we had mentioned, uh, even with like supplements, there's some supplements that uh, you don't notice they work until you stop taking them. And, you know, as far as training, doing something with a specific bar or a specific machine for a while, then switching back to what you used to do, you don't realize how much of an effect using that new piece of equipment actually had until you swap it out. Because I definitely noticed it swapping out on, um, on bench so far because switching back to a straight bar, bar was much thinner, felt much lighter. And the range of motion felt so much shorter. You know, it would hit your chest and you would say, wow, that's it. I don't have to go any lower, you know. Uh, so it was a big, big difference. But switching to it initially, I really didn't think it had much of a difference. Uh, but once you go back to it, yeah. So I'm sure I'm going to experience that with the squat as well. Yeah, like I said, it was bothering my shoulder a little bit. So that's the only reason why we switched. But it was probably because of the increased range of motion. So, All right, man. So again, guys, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel because we're going to do a lot of big things come New Year's. Uh, New Year's come January 1st. So uh, make sure you subscribe. Head on over to NewYorkMuscleRadio.com slash video. But um, I have a cool trending topic today. We also have a listener question that we could play now live on the podcast. So I'll um, I'll introduce what the, the trending topic is, and you'll get your take on it, and then I'll pull up that listener question. But the trending topic today, um, I saw a picture of Dallas McCarver weighing 318 pounds, and he looks ripped, man. He's insane. He looks like he's a couple weeks out. So uh, his coach is Chad Nichols. Okay. Mm-hmm. And this is like bodybuilding talk. We never talk bodybuilding yeah, talk. It's been a while. But I think this has, uh, you know, a good, how I'm going to tie it to everyone listening to this is he chose a 15 week diet, even though, so Dallas is someone who naturally sits a little leaner and they chose to diet down 15 weeks as opposed to eight, which realistically looking at his pictures, he could have probably died at eight weeks and got in shape. So um, I'm, re- I'm going to read this verbatim from what Chad Nichols wrote. He said, this was my first time working with Dallas. So I had many questions that I needed answered before we got into the meat of his prep. This is why they chose a 15-week prep. Uh, number two, very few preps ever go perfect. And when you don't have that one that goes flawless from start to finish, you remember that prep forever. However, the fact is that there are so many obstacles that can pop up during prep, blah, blah, blah. Uh, number three, when you have an athlete the size of Dallas that trains with the volume and intensity that he does, the variable is huge is a huge part of his prep. Being able to keep his amount of foods high will ensure that his training is always 100%. Number four, this ties with number three. When you are in this type of shape early on, cardio can be kept at a minimum. Dallas will never, uh, will probably never be able to do more than three days a week of cardio, and his cardio will never be longer than 30 minutes in duration. The ideal situation would be deeper into get into his diet. The more we'll have to back off the cardio and increase his calories. Uh, but by doing this, it will ensure that his training will be bolstered to the wall the way through prep. And number five, Keeping his food intake at a high level will ensure he will not have to deplete him down. The body will also be able, be able to hold much more glycogen. This is probably one of the most critical mistakes big guys make. They end up in a depleted state throughout most of their prep and therefore find it difficult to maintain any kind of fullness when it comes loading come contest time. So what's your, what's your take on that, man? I, I mean, I, I think that's, that was solid uh, stuff from his coach there. Yeah, I actually agree with everything he said, um, especially – Especially because Dallas is a very big guy, but you know, even so, if you're not, even if you're a natural competitor and you're, you know, 180, 200 pounds dieting down for a show, and you have a decent amount of muscle, the key really is that you want to do a few things. One, you want to keep your calories as high as possible. You want to maintain as much fullness as possible. You want to do as minimal as the minimal amount of cardio you need to do to get the job done, and you want to hold on to as much muscle. And realistically, the best way to do that is a longer prep. You know, a lot of times people don't want to get into a long prep because they think that a longer prep just means, okay, I'm going to suffer for 15 weeks as opposed to eight. But in reality, a 15-week prep done properly will allow you to diet on more calories, will allow you to do less cardio, and will, you know, ultimately be less overall suffering during that time. You know, um, you're always going to suffer the last few weeks just because you're so lean. But if you give yourself enough time, uh, you don't have to make it 15 weeks of hell as opposed to doing eight weeks of hell. You know what I mean? 15 weeks at a moderate to intense amount of work being done versus eight weeks all out where you don't have any room for error. Um, You really have to deplete the bodybuilder. Like he said, Uh, you're going to end up losing fullness. You, You could end up losing muscle. And Overall, it's just your training intensity is going to go down because you're on so little calories. So uh, the goal is always to feed feed them as much as possible. And if it takes longer, you're still better off as long as you get the job done. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I just thought that was interesting that this is an IFBB pro and we're just related to everybody else on how it's really important to always be meticulous with your diet and just focus on what's going on. Yeah, that's the thing. A lot of times, you know, 
IFBB pros with elite level genetics, I mean, someone especially like Dallas McCarver, he could do a lot of things wrong and still come in in excellent shape, like phenomenal shape, even if he did an eight week prep where he just depleted himself. Um, just because he has those genetics, he's an elite, you know, he's got elite genetics, um, you know, but if you want to do things optimally, there's smarter ways to go about it. And someone with his genetics, if he takes that route and does it, uh, you know, he optimizes everything. He's going to come in looking even better. So I think anybody can take take you know something away from that. All right, guys, we're going to move on to the listener question of the day. Again, guys, if you have a question you'd like us to answer, you could submit it on our website, NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. So listener question, or you can call your question in now at 508 687 Two five three four. The phone number is listed on the site. So again, if you can't remember the phone number, it's NewYorkMuscleRadio.com slash listener question. So here's today's question. Hey guys, this is Sean West out of Chicago, Illinois. Hey, my question is, when you're counting your macros, if you're making a dish like chili or chicken soup or broccoli and cheese casserole, how do you figure out your macros for that meal. So you combine all the ingredients and you want to know how much you get out of one cup. How does that happen? All right, so that was the listener question of the day. So, Sean, thank you for calling in and asking your question. I think that was a good question because I think that's a common question that most people have when starting to count macros. Yeah, that's definitely one of them where you might run into a little trouble only because uh, it's not as cut and dry as just taking the food label. I mean, if you were to make some type of meal like that right out of the box, it would be simple, cut and dry, uh, read the food label, scan it, put it into your MyFitnessPal. Uh, but if you're going to make something like that at home, uh, the only true way you're actually going to be able to know the exact macronutrients in it would be if you measured everything out before and then mixed it together. Um, that would be if you're you know really meticulously tracking that would be the only way to get it done. Um, not necessary in every situation. Uh, what you could do is you could either, you know, you can make a you can make a meal like that kind of as a test, and then from now on, if you make it in bulk, um, you know, you have the macros, and you could just pretty much measure it based on the average. It's not, it's not going to be perfect that way. If you're contest prepping, like we were talking about just before, that's when you want to know the exact amount of protein, carbs, and fats down to the exact gram. If you're in a general fat loss phase or maintenance phase. Uh, estimating it is definitely going to get the job done. You're not going to have too much error. It might be a little bit here and there, but there's always a margin of error no matter what you do. Uh, but contest prep is, is another animal altogether where you need to know exact grams of everything. Yeah, I mean, what I usually do is um, I usually take all the ingredients. I'll, if I'm eyeballing it and I'm tracking loosely, I'll just kind of, all right, you know, this, for, for example, a chili. Okay, I use 93.7 chili here. I use a cup of tomato sauce. I've used... Uh, Oh, uh, corn, a cup of corn. That's kind of how I uh, eyeball it, you know? Um, if Again, if I'm being meticulous, I'll measure everything out beforehand. But that was a good question. I thought that was, uh, so again, like, so, like I said, someone always has that question when dieting, especially the, a new person who's new to counting macros. Yep. And, uh, you'll, you know, the biggest thing is you'll find, you'll find your way of doing it. There's, you know, you're asking us and, you know, we could give you our advice in the way we like to do it. And honestly, in, in many cases, there's, there's more than one way to do it, you know, and you got to find what works for you. Um, you know, what's the most convenient for you again, cause that's all about what flexible dieting is about. You know, you want to make this as convenient as possible on yourself. All right, guys, we're going to take a short commercial break and we'll be right back with Mike to share. And today's podcast, number 27, this was. Wow. Going back. It's Dominic the donkey. Jingity jing. The Italian Christmas donkey. La, 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 But I'll tell you what, when I'm done, my biceps are humongous. Humongous. My name is Anthony Bevilacqua, and I'm the host of New York Muscle Radio Podcast. My arms have been a weak point for years. When I started training, my arms measured 11 inches. Even after many years of hardcore training, nothing would get them to grow. With the help of my co-host, Big E, we set out on a mission to gain one solid inch to my arms in 12 weeks. In the greatest experiment of all. 12 weeks later, this program finally helped me get 18 inch arms. 
The 12 Week Arm Experiment, the ultimate arm growth program, ebook, the audio book, and the workout video. Pick up your copy now on NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. What's up, New York Muscle Radio listeners? It's your co host, Big P. Kacharian, and I'm glad you're all listening. Put down that tilapia and asparagus. Learn how to get bigger, stronger, and leaner eating what you want. Pick up a copy of Cracking the Flexible Diet Co. exclusively at NewYorkMuscleRadio.com. But for now, let's get to the show. All right, guys, we're back. New York Muscle Radio, episode number 27. And we got on the line here, Big Mike Teixeira. What's up, Mike? How are you, buddy? How's everything? Uh, doing well, doing well. Um, yeah, things are things are normal out here, uh, out here in Colorado. So uh, just enjoying life, man. So, so Mike's joining us very early his time. I believe it's 6.30 <laughs> for him. So we didn't know it was uh, that early for him. But no, was, no, it's not a problem. I feel like you guys are doing me a favor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for the listeners who don't know you, who is Mike Teixeira in a nutshell? Um, well, uh, probably the thing that's going to interest them the most um, these days, I'm a powerlifter and powerlifting coach. Um, yeah, I've been doing uh, powerlifting coaching since 2004. I've been competing uh, or been I've been training since 1997. Um so definitely put a lot of time into this, and um, I've been doing it as a full-time thing since about 2012. Um, you know, we've been doing it longer than that, but at the time I was in the Air Force, uh, so I couldn't really dedicate, you know, full efforts to it. But uh, since 2012, this has been my, my full focus is uh, coaching people. Um, things have been going really well with it, too. You know, we're um, it's, it's easy to kind of put up the guys that are – competing well at world championships and stuff like that. And they're, uh, I don't know, like, uh, setting records and, you know, doing this really impressive stuff. It's easy to hold those people up, but I mean, just as important as those people are the people who are, you know, not at that level yet, but you know, they're just interested in getting stronger. And I think that's a cool thing about powerlifting is that's like the one thing that ties everybody together is this pursuit of the next PR, you know, like I'm trying to PR my lifts just like, you know, the next guy is just like my training partners are. It doesn't really matter so much what the absolute strength level is. You know, the plates come on and off the bar. Uh, so uh, we just, you know, we're all kind of after the same thing. It's so funny because I was talking to Pete. Both of us have competed in uh, bow, uh, bodybuilding and uh, I recently competed in powerlifting. And I was telling Pete, I said, you know, the one thing with bodybuilding and powerlifting is powerlifting is either you lift it or you don't. Bodybuilding, it's more of an opinion. So it's so funny you see the weight comes on and off the bar. Yeah. So yeah, how did yeah. you get into the coaching aspect of the sport? How did that start for you? It kind of came to me, actually. Uh, all around, it kind of came to me. So I was, uh, I was training. I was competing in powerlifting. Uh, and then when I went to the Air Force Academy, um, we had a, a club powerlifting team. And... Um, the first year I was there, there were maybe three or four uh, of us on the team, so not very many. And then, um, you know, as as time went on, you know, I was trying to grow the club and uh, grow the team and everything. So I'm like making efforts to recruit people, and uh, so you get people interested, you know, and they're like, "Well, I've never lifted weights before, or maybe they've lifted weights before, but they've never like competed in powerlifting before. So what do I do now?" Uh, so you're kind of like, well, I'm the one who's been here the longest at that point, you know, so it, it fell to me to help coach them and help bring them along. Um, so I started doing it that way. Um, and then I learned a ton while I'm coaching these guys, right? So I, I was coaching these guys for about three years and I was able to um, do like an internship with the strength and conditioning coaches uh, there at the academy and everything. And as time went on, you know, I'm like, man, I'm learning a ton here. I should write some of this down. So my original thought was I'm going to write like this article series and try to get it published in Powerlifting USA or something like that. Uh, but it just grew and grew and grew and eventually got to the point where I'm like, you know, this is really a book. So I self-published a book. And I was just kind of hoping to that that would uh, do well enough that I could cover travel expenses or something like that. 
But then one day somebody emailed me and was like, hey, will you coach me online? And I didn't even know that was a thing. Like, I didn't know you could do that. Uh, but I'm like, yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, so then, you know, you start that whole process, you know, you start developing processes and systems and stuff like that to develop uh, coaching in this in this other format. And it's just kind of gone from there. So let's let's back up a little bit here. So how did you get into powerlifting? How long have you been training yourself? Uh, so I started training in 1997. Um, I uh, played football in high school, uh, so that's a, a great reason to start lifting weights and why a lot of people start lifting weights, I think. But I mean, I've always been kind of fascinated by strength, and uh, I remember, um, I remember uh, kind of getting on the internet and and looking for stuff about lifting weights. And uh, there wasn't as much out there at the time, you know. Mm. And uh, I remember looking for powerlifting just because it it was a word that I had heard at some point, you know. And um, yeah, looking it up and like, oh, okay, so that's what powerlifting is. And I really kind of became instead of like a football player that lifts weights in the off season, I really kind of became like the a powerlifter who played football in the off season, you know? So it very quickly became like my focus in terms of athletics. What position did you play in football? Were you as big at that time? I was pretty big. Um, as a freshman, I don't remember exactly what my weight was. Sometime during my freshman year, I remember I weighed around 195 because that was the first time I, I benched my body weight and I thought that was a big deal. Um, <laughs> But when I graduated high school, I was about 250 pounds. Um, I played guard and uh, defensive tackle. And obviously, powerlifting, uh, you chose that to go that route as opposed to football. <clears throat> Do you think you, if you would have went the football route, things would have been different for you as far as like, uh, you know? So I tried to go, I tried to play football, actually. So when I got to the academy, um, no, I came from a small school in Indiana, and I don't think... Uh, I don't think we knew a whole lot about like the recruiting process or how to get any of that done. Um, but I was going to the Air Force Academy anyway, so who cares? Uh, when I got there, I thought, well, I'm going to try out for the team, you know. So I tried to walk on to the football team, and uh, this was like right after basic training. So we get there, and I ran a forty. And they were like, okay, forget it, you know, so, <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> what did um, you run the 40 in? Do you remember? I don't remember, but it was terrible. It was, it was <laughs> terrible. Like, so I go to basic training, you know, 250 pounds, you know, I'd been lifting weights and, you know, getting in great shape and everything in preparation for this. And then basic training comes, I lost like 25 pounds in six weeks and uh, didn't lift weights the entire time or anything like that, you know, and then like the very next week we go run a 40 and uh, yeah, it, it was just not good. Um, but yeah, you know, it was, it was kind of a blessing in disguise, I guess, because um, because of that, uh, I joined the powerlifting team, you know, I got to, even before I graduated, you know, I got to travel the world and, and see a lot of cool stuff. I went to Bulgaria in 2006, which was a hard sell uh, to the, uh, to the academy leadership at the time, you know, I had to convince them like, you know, me missing classes, this is going to be good for me, you know, um, you know, try to go on this trip to Bulgaria, but, um, you know, that all worked out, but those are opportunities I wouldn't have had if I had played football, you know, I would have been like a, a mediocre football player at, at a place like that, you know, um, you know, instead of going on to play, uh, or go compete in powerlifting. And I've obviously done much better in powerlifting. It's so funny how life kind of throws things at you and everything kind of happens for a reason, right? It's so funny when yeah. that's how true that is. Yeah, and I mean, you adjust and you adapt, overcome and stuff like that, you know. And I don't think that's anything that's terribly unique. I mean, you guys probably have similar stories of different things. Like you tried to do this, it didn't work out, but, you know, things end up working out better in the long run or – you know, you keep trying, you and persist, and through persistence, you know, you eventually get to where you're trying to get. You know. Yep. So, yeah. was there a specific? This is a question that me and people have for you because you know you hit certain milestones, uh, especially powerlifting, that you're excited to hit. Um, so, was there one in specific? Let's say like a bench press, deadlift, squat that you were like super excited, like you know that you finally got that 315 bench. I mean, you you mentioned your yeah. body weight uh, bench press one, but uh, is there any other ones? Because I 
you know, for me, I know hitting a 405 bench would be like, oh my God, I'm, I've done the impossible. Yeah. So, so yeah. what's like, was that, was that happening for you as you went along in the sport? Um, sometimes I think, um, but a lot of times I think I did stuff and didn't realize it until like, I didn't realize that it was good or how good it was until later. Um, which that might be important as well. Uh, <laughs> um, like I remember I, when I deadlifted, uh, 800 pounds, um, like I knew that that was a good deadlift, but I don't think I realized uh, fully at the time, like that that was a really good deadlift, you know? Um, so I mean, I, like I just did it and it was on my way to the next thing, you know? Um, which that might be important, like an important mentality, but I do remember, uh, squatting 500 pounds and, and even, even like getting close to 500 pounds, um, like that's the moment when it became fun, you know, like up to that point, you know, squatting is a chore and, you know, like it, it's a little different now. Like people, you know, post memes on Facebook about leg day and stuff like that. And, and I, I think a lot of it's talk, but you know, whatever. Um, but that wasn't the case then you know, uh, people didn't really like to squat and, and I, a lot of people still don't like to squat, but I think once you get to a certain level of strength and you're moving a, a good amount of weight, then it's fun. You know? Yeah. It's a definitely a, it's, it's an art trying to get up from being crushed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So along your journey, cause I know, you know, especially like I said, for me and for Pete, you know, a lot of, I would say new people entering the sport also, you know, you have these certain, you know, 135 on bench, 225, 315, like those big milestones. Did you find like one point was harder for you than another or it was just like, all right, you know, I just did another thing another day, you know? Well, um, maybe not great news, but I think it just gets harder as you go. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I've, been, I've been working on, uh, you know, these next set of milestones for several years now, you know, and I mean, it, it makes sense, you know, once you've been trying to master a, a craft for something like, you know, you know, 12 or 15 years, you know, you've gotten, you've gotten pretty good at it. And, you know, to get that next increment up is going to be a lot harder, you know, and it gets exponentially harder as you go. Um, it's not a bad thing, though, you know, and, and I think the answer to that is to stop focusing so much on the milestones. Like, for me... I'll, I'll put this out there and, and I probably shouldn't, but, um, the next milestone for, for me on the squat is an 800 pound squat. Um, it's been something I've been working on for quite a few years, you know, uh, but it's not necessarily good for me to focus too much on that as a milestone, you know? So like if I'm in a competition setting or even just like maxing out in a gym setting, um, if 795 is there, then it would make sense to take 795 instead of 800. You know, mm -hmm. you would take put something on the bar that you can make. You know, put a PR on the bar that you can make rather than a big PR that's a milestone. You know, and then keep training. The milestone will get there when it gets there. You know. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of people overlook that too. When you get over a certain weight, you know, even five pounds on the bar makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah, you know, and even if you just think of it from like just the likelihood that you've had a great day in the past, you know, like you've been doing this for 10 or 12 years or something like that. And your chances are you've had some really great days, you know, uh, whereas, you know, if you've been training for six months, you maybe have not had one of those yet, you know? Yeah. So. And actually I have a question now that he, he mentioned that I, I'm glad he mentioned that, especially at your level where you, you know, you've been training for so long, a lot of power this, I mean, any people, anybody who goes to the gym, in general, it seems to get discouraged when they have bad days versus good days. And I'm curious to know at your level, how frequent would you say those bad days come up compared to the good days? Do they become more frequent because you're training at such a high level or do you find that you rarely have bad days? I tend to not have bad days very often, uh, like exceptionally bad days. Like there will be, you know, maybe a movement that's off or something here or there, you know, maybe every couple weeks or something like that. Um, but it's not like really bad. Uh, 
and I think that's important to to manage your training so that you're having success and so that success builds on itself. You know, um, I see a lot of people who have bad days consistently. You know, maybe they're and, and to me maybe it's an indicator that something's off in the training process. So maybe. Uh, we're squatting too frequently because you're not recovered enough for that second or third squat session. Uh, and that's consistently a, a, a poor session, you know, and if that's disruptive to the overall momentum, you know, then that's, that's not a good thing, you know, like that's something I tell people all the time. Like we have to build momentum. And what I mean by that is like success builds on itself and we have to, we have to start with a small success and then build that up over time. So if you have somebody who's, uh, you know, maybe kind of in a downward spiral, you know, they're having a bad day and they get pissed off. And so the next time, uh, you know, they try harder, you know, well, trying harder only works if you're not trying hard enough already. And most people, you know, that are taking this seriously are trying hard, you know, so they're kind of get lost in this spiral of you have a bad day, and then that causes another bad day and so on, you know, well, you got to take a, take a step back, you know, voluntary step back and have one session with a small success. Even if that's like lowering your expectations, just hit some weights that you can succeed with. And then in the next session, you try to build on that just a little bit. And then you build on that just a little bit and you kind of get your momentum going again. You know, I think that that's, that's important. And if you're training in a style that's kind of disruptive to that overall momentum, I think that's a bad thing. So, yeah, I guess I guess the, the point is um, I don't have a ton of bad days, and I think it's important to try to keep it that way. I think all life kind of goes like that. You know, you look at the, the end goal in mind, and, you know, you're just like, oh, I'm never going to get there. But you got to realize you got to take that first initial step. You know, a journey of a 10,000 steps begin with, begins with the first one. Right. So if you don't, like you said, consistently build up on those small little increments, you know, yeah. over the course of a year, you've achieved a lot. Right. And I mean, that's the thing, um, like, I think people who have been lifting for a little while get it, you know, that, um, you know, if you could add, you know, even two pounds, five pounds uh, to a lift a week, you know, that's maybe not a lot and it's not as satisfying uh, as, you know, a a big PR, you know, a 20 pound, 30 pound PR or more. Um, but those little increments done consistently over a year or something like that, they add up to a lot, you know, and I would take that every time. I agree a hundred percent. So we're going to shift things a little bit now. Being that you're a 275 pound drug free athlete, what type of nutritional requirements do you have? Do you have like a structured diet or do you just kind of eat whatever, whatever you want? Man, my nutrition is is not uh, uh, a model. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must be doing something right. Well, um, yeah. So uh, I I don't take in as many calories as a lot of people think. Um, so normal maintenance for me is around thirty three hundred, maybe thirty five hundred calories a day. Um, so it's not quite as many as as a lot of people think. Um, and then in terms of like uh, food quality, um, it, it's kind of whatever's available. And um, since I'm I'm busy with a lot of things, a lot of times uh, it tends to be you know I grab something on the go or heat something up in the microwave. It's uh, um, also uh, this is an, this is important. I like uh, I like cake. <laughs> I've definitely got a sweet tooth. Um, yeah, so uh, I, however I structure my diet, it needs to include uh, plenty of cake. plenty of junk food. So. What, what, what kind of cake? What kind of cake? Uh, just whatever, probably whatever's in a wrapper. Uh, it's easy to eat. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so I don't know. It it's something that I'm working on. Actually, I'm trying to clean it up a little bit, but it's also something that. I know that if I just try to overhaul it all at once, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so I'm just like trying to slowly uh, ratchet things down a little bit. You know, so in the process, um, over the last, I don't know, six months or so, I'm, I'm trying to um, make sure that I'm getting enough protein. And then, 
you know, since I seem to have that part down, you know, I'm trying to start controlling some other macros and stuff like that. Actually, if you go back a few years, I used to be really good at, um, at controlling my macros. And uh, I followed a diet that was uh, kind of a carb cycling diet, uh, really uh, focused on, on macro intake. And it worked really well. I got, I mean, I got pretty lean for, for me. Um, I got down to about 255 pounds, you know, and, and um, yeah, it was, it was good. Um, strength was still there and everything, but I got really burned out on that method, you know, like just tracking everything and trying to plan things out and stuff. And, you know, as the speed of life picks up, as it always does, um, I just got out of that, you know. And uh, so for a few years there, it kind of lapsed into, you know, just eat whatever keeps your weight up. And uh, so now, you know, kind of in the spirit of leave no stone unturned, you know, I'm trying to tighten things back up a little bit, you know, so that it it's still got to ma- match up with the rest of life, you know, but um, I could definitely do <laughs> to pay a little better attention to my diet. We got to show you how to make a protein cake. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> do you think nutrition is important to powerlifting? Like, so what are your top tips for your athletes as far as nutrition goes? So anyone who wants to work with you, do you give them, I mean, maybe not nutritional advice, but are there certain things that you require for your athletes? I mean, because, you know, powerlifting training is, is dem- you know, it's pretty hard. It's not easy. It's definitely yeah. demanding on your body. So is there any in specific, specific tips you give? A little bit, but, you know, I mean, I understand too that uh, nutrition – pretty rapidly gets outside of my area of expertise. So I'll give a little bit of advice, but if, if people need something, you know, more specific or more detailed, uh, then we'll definitely refer those to some experts and, uh, and they can get, um, the advice that they're, uh, looking for. Uh, but what I talk about, uh, the first thing that we have to cover is uh, getting enough calories in to maintain your weight or do whatever you're trying to do with your weight. Uh, so if they're moving up a weight class and they've got to eat more and moving down a weight class, you've got to eat a little less, of course. You know, So um, we definitely start there. You know, And then the next thing is get enough protein. And I'll tell people, you know, for powerlifting purposes, I think it's like a gram of protein per pound of body weight up to about 220 grams a day. I, for me, I don't see a whole lot of benefit in going past that. Uh, and I know that some of, some people have experienced digestive issues when they go past that as well. You know, so I feel like that covers their bases. And, uh, if they're getting up to around 220 grams a day for a big guy, you know, I, I feel like they're okay. Um, and past that, you know, like the other things for a power lifter, uh, drop off, considerably after we cover those first two milestones. So if they're doing those two things and they want to go past that, then, you know, we'll get more, we can get a little bit more into, um, you've got to start controlling your macros, but at the point where, okay, what should my macros be? I, I, I mean, I've got some ideas for myself, but not anything that I'm comfortable enough, uh, saying, you know, well, you know, this is solid and I feel comfortable recommending this to someone else, you know, so I'll uh, refer out at that point. Makes a lot of sense. So one of the things that you're really known for, and you mentioned your book is the RPE scale. So what is the RPE scale? Let's go over that a little bit. Sure, sure. So RPE stands for rate of perceived exertion. And it's basically like how hard did a set feel, you know, but uh, I, add some clarification to that because people seem to misunderstand me. Like, I don't mean like how hard did it feel in your heart or anything like that? You know, (laughs) I'm talking about like performance oriented, like how did, how did you perform on that set? And you can think of it as a reps and reserve, uh, sort of concept. And I know that, uh, Eric Helms and Mike Zordos are publishing some research on like a reps and reserve scale. Um, based on the RPE chart that that was in the book, um, so I, I think that's maybe an easier way to think about it. So if you do a set, you know, let's say you do a set of five and you rack the bar and you say, "I could have done one more," then we call that a nine RPE. You know, you've got one rep in the tank. Um, we just call that a nine RPE. You know, so like a max effort is a ten RPE. One rep in the tank is a nine. 
two reps in the tank is an eight and, and so on down the line, you know. Um, we spend most of our time uh, training seven RPE and above, uh, but this is just a tool that lets us communicate a little bit better, you know. So if you do a set and you rack the bar and you say, man, that was really hard, I don't know what that means. You know, how hard is hard, you know. Uh, how easy is easy? Like, ah, oh, smoke that one. Well, okay, what does that mean? You know, uh, so especially in an online setting, like this came about and, and was definitely useful before I got into online coaching. But especially in an online setting, it's really useful for me. You know, so if you come back and say that was a nine RPE, then I know exactly how how that felt to you. You know, and we can make adjustments based on that. Um, it's a really useful skill to develop for competitions and stuff like that. You know, so if you take your opener and you know it's supposed to be a, a seven and a half RPE and today it's a seven, hey, this is going to be a good day, you know, so we're going to plus the weight up a little bit, you know. It's just a, an easy way to communicate that. Um, so for starters, like kind of base, it, base level, we can communicate better with RPE. You know, I, we can talk to each other about how hard did it feel and stuff like that. And then if you go beyond that, you can auto-regulate the weight on the bar using RPE. So auto-regulate, that's uh, to automatically adjust up or down the weight on the bar a given day. Like we were just talking about good days and bad days. Um, I seem to be pretty consistent. Other people seem to be a bit more volatile in their daily performance. You know? And on top of that, uh, there are always unexpected things that can happen. You know? Um, you know, whatever you forgot your pre-workout or whatever. Um, so the, the idea is that on a good day, you'll use more weight and on a bad day, you'll use less weight and auto regulation is a concept that's in use in basically every successful powerlifting program in the world. Uh, they all use some sort of auto regulation method. Um, it's not necessarily RPE. Most of the time, actually it's uh, the coach's eye, you know, so the coach is standing there watching the lifter. Like, so if you're, powerlifting in in Russia or someplace you know the coach is standing there watching you and he sees like hey you're moving like crap today so we're gonna lower the weight you know by two or three percent or something like that well for most of us we're training you know by ourselves or maybe with one or two gym buddies um, so we have to have a way for that to happen automatically so where the RPE comes in the in the the picture if your RPEs are too high for that day, then you're going to use a little bit less weight. So if I, let me give you an example. If I send you to the gym and I say, I want you to do three, uh, I want you to squat, do a triple at a nine RPE. So you're going to start to work the weight up, you know, and you ramp up gradually, you know, and let's say you do a triple at an eight RPE, you know, you go, man, this weight's usually not an eight RPE. It's usually easier than that. Uh, so you do a little bit more and yeah, the weights are just feeling a little heavy today. So you, you don't go as heavy as you normally would, but you still get that triple at a nine RPE. So you're still getting the training effect that we're looking for. You know, it's just maybe doesn't require as much weight on that particular day, but it works both ways too. So I found that we end up spending too much time talking about how to mitigate bad days and stuff like that. You can have good days in the gym too. So if you go to the gym and you're having like this really kick-ass session, you know, and all the weights are flying and you feel like like the Hulk, then load up a little bit more weight. You know, if your weight that should be a triple at a nine RPE is actually feeling like an eight RPE, then use more weight. You know, and get that get a PR, get the training effect that we're looking for. You know, so yeah, I mean, it, kind of in a nutshell, that's kind of the next level of RPE is to auto-regulate the weight on the bar um, using this method. But yeah, I think that that's a, a really useful way to go. Do you find that uh, a lot of lifters have trouble accurately gauging where they are on the RPE scale? You know, because Absolutely. I, know it, I know it's tough. A lot of times you'll get under the squat bar and you might feel like, oh my God, this is a nine or even a 10. And then your gym partner will tell you, honestly, it looked like you had at least three or four, men, four more in the tank. Right, right. It's definitely a skill. It's definitely something that you have to practice and get get better at. Um, there's also some research on that, which is interesting. Um, so uh, basically, you have some lifters in a lab, and uh, the 
the people administering the experiment are experienced lifters. And I was talking to them, you know, offline, you know, and the, they're saying, you know, it's, it's difficult because you're watching these people do a squat, let's say, and, you know, you ask them to rate their RPE and, and, you know, because you're an experienced lifter, like that was a 10 RPE, like there's nothing left on that one. And you, you ask them to rate it and they're like, uh, seven, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, it was not a seven, but, <laughs> um, so yeah, there's definitely a skill component that goes along with it. And so what I tell people is not to jump in like with both feet. Don't start it, you know, completely right away. Keep doing whatever program you're doing. Uh, keep using whatever weights that program tells you to use. But just start rating your RPE. Just practice. You know, write it next to the set in your training log. And even if it doesn't regulate the weight, you'll be able to see some trends. You know, like, hey, uh, you know, I squatted this weight last week squatted it again this week and this week it was a little bit easier you know hey that's cool you know even if it's not a hundred percent accurate it's it's a good feedback tool you know and then with a little bit of time and practice you'll get better at it you know and you should you know you should use video feedback you should um, get your training partner's opinion a little bit uh, I, I like video feedback a little bit better but you know take whatever uh, whatever tools you have available to you, you know, uh, use that stuff to help you get better at it. And then eventually once you're comfortable rating RPE, you know, what'll happen, it'll just happen organically. Like, um, you'll be doing a, a workout and let's say you're having a really good day and a weight that's normally supposed to produce like a nine RPE is only producing like an eight RPE. So everything's feeling easier than it normally would. You're going to start asking yourself like, man, should I move the weight up? Like uh, things are feeling really good today. Like the RPEs are low. Everything's feeling good. Should I move the weight up um, in response to that? And when you start asking yourself that question, you know that you're ready to take that step. You know, you're ready to go ahead and, and yeah, increase the weight on good days, uh, decrease the weight a little bit on bad days, you know, and just kind of take what's there and build your momentum. So I know everyone is built different, but how do you typically structure a lifter's program? So if someone comes to you for you know some online coaching, how do you typically go about structuring the athlete's program to gain strength? You know, it's obviously you know this is powerlifting, so we're talking about adding weight to the big three. Uh, let's see. So we start out with a questionnaire, um, and I get a ton of information from this questionnaire: uh, current strength levels, training history. Uh, equipment availability, like a, a whole bunch of stuff, and then you from that will build um, will build a training plan from that. And I've got a framework that I go through. Um, you have to understand the context that the lifter is in, you know, and you have to have different strategies available uh, for people in different situations. So, for example, um, the training that I'm doing right now is really time intensive. Uh, I feel like it's really effective and it, things are going really well for me right now. But if I had somebody that signed up who's like, I only have an hour and a half per session, then we're not going to do the same style of training that I'm going that I'm doing because it's so time intensive. Like it doesn't matter if it's the best strategy in the world. Um, if they can't do it, then it's not a good strategy, you know? So it has to be tailored to, to fit that athlete. And there are other strategies out there that are still effective that, mesh better with their life. So for that individual, it's going to be more effective, you know? So, uh, we go through their questionnaire, uh, and we learn a lot about them as a lifter, you know, and then we develop the program from there. Uh, we'll develop a template, uh, which is just kind of how the exercises are ordered in like in a given day. Um, uh, excuse me it, for a given week rather. Uh, so we'll, come up with that. Uh, we'll come up with the strategy that we want to use. You know, are we going to default to higher RPEs or lower RPEs? How do we want the block structure to work? Uh, what exercises are we going to select? You know, if we're further out from a competition, we'll include more general exercises, you know, exercises that are more muscularly oriented. And then as we get closer to competition, we get more and more specific. And then, um, we have annual planning options as well. So, we can develop um, an, a yearly plan. I mean, it's not set in stone, but it's it's a yearly progression so that we spend some parts of the year developing certain characteristics 
and then we use those characteristics later on in the year. Um, and just kind of balancing all that stuff out can be quite a task, but, um, you know, and we don't, like as far as the annual planning stuff, we don't use that for everybody, uh, but usually people that are competitive at a national level or just not necessarily like competing for the win at a national level, but like they're, let's say, you know, high 300s, maybe a 400 Wilkes, um, they're doing, you know, they're pretty competitive at a national level at that point. You know, they're definitely not a novice. And uh, so for them, we'll start to bring in more annual planning and stuff like that. So I feel like I didn't really answer your question, uh, but that's a, a really big question to answer. Well, it's a, yeah, I was just going to say it's a tough question to answer because everyone's everyone is different. But um, so you take I, weaknesses into account too, which I, I didn't really mention. So, um, you know, most of the lifters I'm working with nowadays are raw lifters. Um, and weaknesses don't vary. Uh, they don't vary as much as you might think, uh, but they do vary a bit. And uh, we can do some different things with exercise selection uh, to target weak ranges of motion and uh, and stuff like that. So that's a, I guess this is a perfect for my next question. Then, how do you pick an athlete for a meet? So, what does the four the last four week block kind of look like? You know, you really want to get this person in. Let's say they're doing nationals, which is pro, which is about five six weeks away right now. So, let's say they're doing nationals in the last four week block. What would it look like for? Uh, I would say someone like you said, you know, someone with a Wilkes of about four. Hmm. Okay. So that's going to depend on, on the strategy that we're using. So, um, let's see. Wilkes of about four. Uh, so in general, the intensity gets higher and higher as we, as we go into a meet, but I mean, that's nothing groundbreaking, right? Uh, so what we try to do is, uh, we're gradually increasing the intensity but what I've seen is that, you know, if you just increase the intensity and don't pay any mind to the volume, the volume drops too much. So like, let's say you go from doing five sets of five uh, to something like three sets of three, which is a pretty common sort of progression as you go through a cycle. Um, for the way that we do our training, uh, I think that's too much of a volume drop. Um, and what I've seen is that Usually, you know, you hear guys say, oh, I peaked too early for this meet. Um, a lot of times what I've found is that guys that peak too early, uh, their volume just dropped too much, you know. So basically what happens is, your, you know, your volume is up and your, the intensity is going up and so your strength is, is going up as well, you know. And then you get to this point, this inflection point where as the intensity is going up and the volume is dropping, um, eventually the volume drops too much. Now you're not building strength anymore and you're actually, you know, kind of on the downhill slope. Well, you missed your peak um, because the volume dropped too much. So we're paying attention to that. You know, we usually take our, our heaviest week. Uh, these days we're taking our heaviest week, uh, probably 14 days out or something like that. And, um, well, 14 to 21 days out. It's pretty much the same as, as Shaco's recommendations. Uh, and it depends a bit on the lifter and on the template that they're using, you know. So heavier lifters, in general, are going to need more uh, recovery time. Uh, although, you know, we definitely see exceptions to that rule. Um, yeah, we definitely see exceptions. There's to always that. exceptions to the rule. <laughs> right, right. And I mean, that's the thing. Like all this, all this stuff about you know, general, generally this, generally that. It can provide a good starting point. But when you start to apply it to an individual, you know, man, it, it can get thorny. Like, for example, let's say you've got a lighter lifter. Well, they're supposed to be able to – say you've got a lighter female lifter. They're supposed to be able to handle a lot more volume than, say, somebody like me, a heavy man. But I found that my volume tolerance is really high compared to most people. And then if you're – you know, let's throw in another caveat that says our lighter female lifter is also a master's lifter. Let's say she's like – uh, 65 years old, you know, well, there's probably going to be some additional recovery considerations that need to be made there. Like I tell people, we don't treat, uh, age, you know, age is not a problem, you know, but recovery is a problem. So, uh, if recovery gets to be an issue, then we've got to dial things down, you know? So, uh, stuff like that, you know, we have to, we have to consider. And then usually my, 
my meet week, like that last week before the meet, is heavier than American powerlifters are are used to a lot of times. Like we'll take openers uh, usually f- uh, five or six days out, you know, uh, which isn't a groundbreaking of a concept as it used to be. But uh, so when I was learning, you know, you were supposed to do like absolutely nothing during the meet week. Like you just sit on the couch and don't don't do a thing. Um, and I always found that eat I cake. was in <laughs> right eat cake. Right. <laughs> um, I always found that I was in bad shape. Like um, my technique felt rusty, you know. Um, so like I gradually started doing more and more work during that that last meet week. Um, I don't hit openers because I feel like I need them for confidence or anything like that. It's just that that's a really good way to get in some fairly high intensity work with a limited amount of volume. So you go in there and you hit your openers, you maybe do a back off set or two. So you're you're getting you're keeping that volume where it needs to be so you're not on the downhill slope, you know. And uh you're still exposing yourself to heavy enough weights when you get in there on meet day, you know, you're ready to crush it. And we do one or two other sessions uh, in that week leading up to the competition. Uh, but those are a lot lighter, usually uh, just warm ups or something like that. But yeah, and then you show up on meet day. Hopefully you kill it. I guess it depends on that day. Yeah, yeah sometimes. It, sometimes people get in their own mind, I think, right? That you find that to be a, like a big issue. Um, it depends on the lifter, you know, and there's a lot of variance there. Um, you know, my, so my friend, Matt Gary, he's an excellent platform coach. Um, uh, so he, he talks about like when he's coaching a lifter there on meet day, you know, how he tries to, um, he tries to read the lifter themselves and see kind of what, what are they about mentally? You know, are they like one of these lifters that really needs to, um, to get psyched up, do they need that external stimulus or like somebody like me, I don't need it. I, I, it's distracting to me, frankly, you know, um, and for my opening squat, like I've got plenty of nerves and stuff going on anyway. So I'm, I'm actually trying to bring it down a level, you know, just so I can execute how I always do. And, uh, you know, so he talks about like reading the lifter and, and doing stuff like that to, uh, to get a better feel for, you know, what does this lifter need? What can we do for them to maximize their performance? So how much carrier do you think powerlifting has to improving your physique as compared to traditional bodybuilding st- style training? I don't know, you know, when you first started out, if you trained, you know, just specifically with powerlifting, but do you think powerlifting has uh, its place in building muscle and really changing your physique? Yeah, I think it, I think it can. I think it definitely can. And, I think there's a lot of things that bodybuilders, at least in the last several years, have have learned, in my opinion, from powerlifters. Um, it may have not come directly from powerlifting, but it's stuff that powerlifters have done. So, for example, um, back when I was in school, uh, I trained with an upper-lower split, you know, and I would kind of experiment with these higher frequency bouts, you know, squatting, you know, three or four times a week or something like that. And you know, deadlifting higher, with higher frequency and stuff, um, but I could never like make it stick. It took a while for me to basically get in shape to be able to tolerate that kind of work. Uh, but then after I graduated school, uh, I was able to make that transition, and I noticed, man, you know, when I'm, you know, let's say squatting, you know, two or three days a week, and then deadlifting two days a week. You know, so you're basically stimulating legs, um, you know, four, sometimes five days a week. My legs actually grew like freaking crazy, you know, and I was like, man, I put on a ton of leg size with this higher frequency, uh, higher frequency squatting and stuff like that. I didn't really change anything else about the program. So anecdotally, I mean, there's, there's an example of, you know, higher frequency training, which we think of as being more performance oriented, having a really positive effect on physique. You know, um, I think it comes back to volume in most cases, you know, if you're doing something and it helps you tolerate more volume, then over the long run, I think that's going to do good things for, for muscular size. Um, and on the flip side, I think if it, if it 
you know, decreases your volume tolerance, then, you know, you've got to be really careful about the placement and be really careful about why you're doing it, you know. I think that that's a great answer because, you know, a, a lot of bodybuilders forget, you know, the simple fact that a bigger muscle is usually a stronger muscle and, you know, yeah. you kind of neglect those big three and they're important for putting on as much muscle as you can everywhere. Yeah, and I think powerlifters do the same thing with bodybuilding, you know, that, um, and I know I've been guilty of this uh, in the past. It's it's easier and more fun. You know, you take somebody who's like really strength oriented and all they care about is how much they can lift. It, it's easy to fall into this kind of um, uh, pattern where you are always training heavy. You know, you're always doing heavy weights, low reps. Well, it's really difficult to get in any appreciable amount of volume. And if you do, it's really taxing, you know. So it's good to have phases of your training that are backed off uh, of the intensity a little bit so you can get the volume up. Why? So you can grow a muscle because a bigger muscle is a stronger muscle. You know, um, Like uh, uh, Chad Smith came out here to visit uh, a couple weeks ago and we were chatting about stuff like that and, and he said, you know, I think people forget sometimes that muscle moves weights. Mm-hmm. You know, so build, spending some time building your muscles is not, you know, not a bad thing. It's not time wasted. And I mean, he's right about that. I think that, you know, sometimes we can lose sight of that. Yep. So, I mean, and there's a season for everything too, right? So there's, there, and there's times where you should train heavy and really peak your strength. And then other times where, you know, you need to back off and do a little more bodybuilding work, I think. So, you know, typical you know, training has different types of trends, and we've seen this across the you know across the years. You know, training body parts once a week. I'm sure you, in powerlifting it's similar. You know, train your lift as infrequently as possible. Now, higher frequency seems to uh, been taking the key. So, a famous one, and I know you know about it because of Mike Zordos, is uh, DUP. So, what is your view on DUP type training? Uh, do you personally train that way? Uh, what are your thoughts on it? I I think people kind of maybe have a misunderstanding of, of what DUP is. So we've, uh, yeah, Mike Zordos is a friend of mine and we've done some seminars together and he always talks about this in, in the seminars. Like people will email him and, and ask him to send them the DUP. <laughs> right. And like, that's not a thing. DUP is a, a concept, you know, it's not a, a single program. Um, and I, I think people, even people that know that still kind of fall into the the trap of thinking that it's like this one particular style of training like you have to train high frequency you know crippling levels of volume to train in the DUP format but that's not the case at all so basically DUP daily undulating periodization it just means that the uh, the intensity of the work that you do fluctuates every day you know it's not completely linear you know it's not that every day is progressively higher intensity it's that it it undulates it goes up and down you know and this is only I mean if you think about it so daily undulating so we're talking about a a fairly narrow scope if you look at a training week you can see all right within this week there's daily variations it undulates daily so we have daily undulating periodization at the week level you know now, if you zoom out and you look at it over the long term, it can still go like that. You know, you still get these like little waves, but maybe there's an overall trend in the upward direction. So now you've got DUP in the short term mixed with linear periodization in the long term. Hey, so now we're blending different periodization methods and stuff like that. And I know that for him, for the athletes that he coaches, like he definitely blends this stuff together. And he's talked about that in some of our seminars and stuff like you can't just use one periodization model. Like no coach does that in real life. Uh, it's always a blend of different models to, to best fit the athlete. So, I mean, I use DUP in the programs that I write, you know, that just that there's variations in the intensity every day. Um, then when we kind of zoom out at a bigger level, um, you know, we do some other stuff, you know, some blocks are, you know, higher in intensity or lower in intensity. We change things with the exercise selection and stuff like that. So I definitely think it's, it's a valid training method. It's a good training method. And it's something that, you know, lots of successful coaches have done for a long time, you know, but I think we've got to make the distinction between 
something that successful coaches have done versus like what the literature has shown. So, um, to my knowledge, he's the one that's, that's shown it in like uh, controlled studies, you know, to be more effective, you know. You actually, uh, you brought up a good point that I want to touch on a little bit. Uh, you know, if you're doing something like a DUP, um, but also when you're looking in the long term, you mentioned that linearly you're always progressing long term. It might be linear uh, periodization. Now, would you, uh, do you think that that's something that's in terms of volume over the long term uh, that athletes should be striving for, always increasing the volume linearly? I mean, obviously there has to be a ceiling at some point. But yeah. it seems that uh, lifters are always trying to increase something in terms of pr- obviously progression, volume being something that they're always striving for. Do you think that there's an upper limit to where you can go with volume? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that volume – so if we kind of back up and think about like basic principles for a minute, like we're all familiar with the principle of overload, progressive overload. You've got to gradually provide more and more stimulus if you want more and more adaptation. You know, so if you want to go from a 300-pound squat to a 400-pound squat, then you've got to provide more stimulus. To some extent, you can cover that by training with heavier weights. You know, as your strength goes up, you train with heavier weights and your strength goes up some more. But eventually, that kind of peters out. So you have to uh, do something to provide more stimulus, you know, and volume seems to be a really reliable way to do that you know um so increasing the volume is something that's become a lot more a a much more uh, commonly used tactic these days uh, which i think is in general a good thing you know but there is an upper limit to how much volume a person can tolerate you know even like schedule and, and life balance issues aside you know there's just so many hours in a day you know and so you're going to get to this point where you just can't do any more work. So what do you do then? You know, it's really difficult to manage. What do you do then? And you're kind of trying to mitigate some problems and stuff like that. And, and it's just, it's just a sticky situation that's easier to avoid. So if I have a lifter who is used to training three days a week and three days a week is producing results for them, then we're going to keep the volume at a pretty similar level because we know that eventually it's not going to work for them and we need to have some place to go. So one thing that, that I talk about sometimes, you know, if you are training three days a week and, and you're getting results that are about here, if you jump immediately to training every day, let's say, in tremendous volumes, you might eventually make that adaptation and be able to, re- to recover from it and your strength will go up and maybe you'll your strength will go up a lot, you know, but maybe it only goes up to about here and then you kind of sealing out. Then what, you know, and I think you see this happen with some programs like small off, you know, you have somebody who's been lifting for a year or two, I'm going to do small off. Um, that's a bad idea because I mean, it's just such a tremendous amount of volume. So yeah, I mean, they'll do small off and they'll set a 50 pound PR and that sounds really cool, but what's the cost of that? You know, like, where do you go from there? You know, maybe you do small off again, and this time you set a 20-pound PR. And then you do it again, and maybe you don't set any PR at all. You know, okay, well, how do you get more stimulus? You know, do you want to go uh, start doing programs that that are harder than small off just to make, you know, 10 or 15-pound PRs? Keep in mind, you've only been lifting for about two years at this point. So, um, you know, you really can't peak your strength potential in such a short amount of time, you know. You've got to do something that's more um, that's more long term oriented. Like we know that people uh, who've been training for you know ten, fifteen, twenty years, they're they're strong. You know, you don't get super strong in a year or two just by doing the same workouts that uh, you know that advanced lifters do. So I think it's something that you have to phase into. You know, eventually, yeah, you're going to have to do something like that. Yeah, you know, but that's hopefully at the peak of your career and not you know, really early on. So what are the training systems have you used and uh, which one would, did you say you got the most bang for your buck? Cause you've been doing this for years. So obviously you've experimented with probably hundreds of different programs. I mean, you already mentioned small off Chico, uh, you know, sure. So which one has given you the most bang for your buck? Well, so 
So I started uh, lifting weights in 1997. I was a seventh grader uh, at the time. And I thought I knew way more than I did. And I might have known more, uh, probably not more, but uh, I, I think I pretty quickly grew my understanding to, to match or exceed the people around me at, at the time. I mean, there's not powerlifting. Uh, it's not a common thing in Southern Indiana. So, um, by, you know, just researching it, you know, I, I learned a lot about it. So pretty early on, like I would say within the first, uh, I, within the first few weeks of me actually starting to lift consistently, uh, I wanted to write my own program and, you know, so I've basically been doing it ever since. And I've always kind of done my own thing, you know, like I'll take ideas from different programs and stuff like that. I would say probably the one system that I implemented more fully than anything else uh, was Westside. And I spent a lot of years kind of doing that. Uh, but basically, it's always a blend, you know, like even even when I'm doing when I did Westside, um, the system is designed in such a way that you pick your own exercises, you know, you pick your max effort exercises, you pick your assistance exercises. It's supposed to be geared around a weakness and stuff like that, you know, and there's different, you know, there's different band cycles you can do uh, for your dynamic day. You know, there's all this different stuff that you can do. Um, so for, let me give you an example. Um, West side at the time, especially was a really gear heavy, um, like there wasn't a such thing as raw lifting when I was first learning, you know, uh, if you competed in powerlifting, you competed geared and the West side guys, uh, were definitely multiply types and, and stuff like that. Um, I wasn't, I was a high schooler and, uh, I, I lifted with the football team, you know, and, and we did raw lifting. So it just made sense to me, like, for example, training my bench press, to not spend so much time on board work, but to do like pin presses from the bottom or something like that, you know, so I'm selecting exercises that train the bottom, bottom of the lift, you know, so, I mean, even in that way, like I've kind of made all the programs my own and I, I think that's, that's a good thing, you know, like I'll get emails from people sometimes that are like, hey, uh, can I do, you know, I really like the RPE system. Can I do RPE with uh, this other uh, this other program? And I'm like, like it's your training. You can do whatever you want, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and I get what they're asking me. They're not like actually asking me for permission to do it, but like that is the words that they're they using. They want your clarification. Yeah, you know, they're and that's really what they're doing, which is fine, you know. And they're asking, like, do you think it's a good idea or not, and, and so on. But um, I think a lot of people, and, and I've heard other coaches kind of get into this too, like uh, they'll get people that ask them whether it's just kind of a, a, a language thing or what, but uh, they're kind of asking for permission to, to modify the program. Like it's your program, you know, do whatever you want with it. And I think it's good to, to give yourself permission to do that, you know, um, now it's important to also recognize like if you're doing five, three, one and you know, you decide that, you know, I don't like overhead press. So I'm going to, I'm going to do reverse grip bench press instead. Okay. That's great. But if it doesn't work, then you can't say five, three, one sucks because you're not doing that program anymore. And that's fine. Like you should do, like you should take control of your own program. You should modify it. You should, uh, you know, you should do what, what you think is going to give you the best return, you know, especially if you're spending any appreciable time at all learning about this. Um, yeah, you should do what you think is going to give you the best return, but yeah, just don't, don't, uh, don't misunderstand the point that, and think that you're still doing that core program anymore. That's, that's the only caveat, but yeah. We spoke about this in another podcast actually about how, you know, there's so much information out there that it can be overwhelming and you, know, sure. you can get uh, analysis by paralysis by reading all this stuff and just like so confused. So I think you're, you're right on there with, uh, you know, definitely making your own programs and experimenting with yourself because that's the best way you learn what works for you is when you just constantly experiment. And I always say it's important to keep a training journal because it's going to tell you the best feedback on yourself. 
You, know, you could read sure. the, the next best article online, you know, tnationbodybuilding.com, whatever, but until you implement it on yourself, you're not going to know if it's working or not. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, there's ways that you can kind of figure out if it's going to be a good idea or a bad idea. But yeah, I mean, there's lots of things that seem like a bad idea or seem like a good idea that don't pan out in real life. So yeah, I mean, that, that lens of uh, experimentation is always something that, that you've got to keep in mind. Of course. For sure. All right, our last question. I think this is the doozy. Uh, if you could go back in time and talk to young Mike, what program would you tell him to follow to reach his potential as fast as possible? So if you can mm -hmm. go back in time and talk to yourself at in high school, what, yeah. would, you, what would you say? I'd say... Avoid this, yeah. do this, eat cake. <laughs> eat cake, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so, um, just to provide a little context. So when I was in high school, um, I was primarily interested in my raw strength, you know, but I didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, experienced lifters, um, to, to guide me and stuff like that. So I was, you know, learning what I could, um, online. And I think whether I missed the point or or not is up for debate. But anyway, I was squatting with a super wide stance at the time, like feet out to the sides of the rack, wide stance. Now, for a raw lifter, I'm not so I'm not convinced at all that that's the best way for most people. Um, and I never I'd never even tried you know something more moderate. So I would say you know first of all look at look at lifters who kind of are where you want to be and, and see, see what some commonalities are. Don't model them exactly, but just see what some commonalities are. First of all, good raw squatters don't squat that wide, you know, almost nobody. There are a couple here and there and, and I can think of some examples, but almost nobody squats that wide. So try something a little bit narrower and see if you, maybe you're stronger that way, you know, Hey, crazy concept, you know? Um, <laughs> I would say that and I would also say spend more time practicing the lifts that you want to get good at. You know, like I I really went hard on this whole uh West Side thing at that time. You know, so I was trying to uh you know, select these special exercises and stuff like that. I really wasn't that proficient of a squatter yet, you know? So uh and then I would deadlift like once a month or something like that, you know? So I really sucked at deadlifting. Um and it wasn't until like I stopped doing that stuff. And so really what happened, like where I made this transition, um, I was training, 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 and I got my squat up to about a 600 pound raw squat, which was pretty good. Uh, but yeah, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> I, I had noticed that I could do good mornings. I could do like 500 for five good wow, mornings. It's crazy. Like, yeah. So my good mornings were freaking fantastic, you know? Um, and I was like, man, I'm doing all these good mornings. I got really, really good at them. I wonder if I did a whole bunch of squatting, if I would get really, really good at that instead. <laughs> you know? Boo, crazy concept, right? <laughs> so, you know, at that point, I started kind of exploring that a bit more and started training the lifts a lot more. And, and it did. It, you know, my lifts, my lifts went up. You know, and my, my deadlift especially went up rapidly. You know, when you go from like basically not training the deadlift uh, to training it with a moderate amount of frequency and practice, then hey, yeah, that responded really nicely. So just so. following up on that really quick because we're yeah. definitely out of time. But um, you think those accessory movements like the good mornings and uh, you know pin presses, board presses? Do you think obviously they have their place in training? But if you want to become a better overall lifter, you know if you want to improve your big three, you should just be squat, deadlift, and bench pressing. You shouldn't. Well, be they doing definitely that. have their place, you know, and I still do them. I still do them now, you know, so like later today, I've got good mornings planned. Um, but it's not a primary mover of my, of my lifts. The primary thing that moves my lifts forward is practicing the lifts and doing so with a moderate amount of volume. Um, so, you know, something that's high volume enough to drive some adaptation, but you know, moderate enough that you can actually recover from it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, they definitely have their place in the program. Uh, you should definitely use them. But um, the example that I use, uh, I, I don't know if we have, have time for this story or not. But uh, Yeah, go ahead. We do. Okay. So it, it, this is kind of, kind of a joke, but uh, it, it's a good metaphor as well. But um, 
it starts that um, there was a professor and he's teaching this uh, college class, you know, and so he's standing up in front of the class one day and uh, he pulls out from under the desk this big empty jar. And you guys probably heard this before. He pulls out this big empty jar uh, and he says to the class, is the jar full or empty? Well, of course it's empty. Okay. Yeah. So he pulls out a bag of golf balls and dumps the golf balls in, fills the jar completely full of golf balls. He says, now is the jar full or empty? Well, it's full. Okay. So he pulls out a bag of like small pebbles, dumps the pebbles into the jar and the pebbles fall down and they fill up the spaces between the golf balls, you know? Well, now is the jar full or empty? Well, okay. Now, of course, it's full. Uh Aha. Well, he pulls out a, a bag of sand, you know, dumps the sand in. The sand fills up these spaces around the pebbles. Full or empty? Well, uh, the students aren't stupid, so they say, well, if you're asking us this question, it must not be full yet. And he goes, well, you're right. So uh, he pulls out, pulls out a beer, opens up the beer and pulls it, uh, pours the beer on top. And, you know, so now the jar is full, you know. And uh, he says to the students that, um, that this is supposed to be like a metaphor for life. You know, uh, the golf balls represent the, the high priorities in your life. You know, the things that are truly important to your life, you know, like your family, um, you know, the things that are that you hold closest. And that it's important to put those in the jar first, because if you put something else in the jar first, you won't have room for it. So put those in the jar first. And then the pebbles are things that are important, but aren't like those central things, like maybe your job or your house or stuff, stuff like that. The sand is like the little frivolous stuff that doesn't really matter. And then one of the students says, um, so what's the beer supposed to represent? He says, I'm glad that you asked because that uh, the beer just means to represent that no matter how full your life is, there's always room for beer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I tell that tell that joke sometimes. And um, the point that I'm trying to make is that, you know, selecting exercises and stuff like that is pretty much the same. So like your main lifts are like the, the golf balls. Put those in the program first. Make sure that there's room for that stuff. Uh, the pebbles are like derivations of those lifts. So like pause squats or pin presses or something like that. And then the sand is like overhead presses and good mornings and lunges. You know, it's, it's important if you want to get this jar as full as possible, it's important. But that other stuff has to be in place first. You know, so really a long way to, to tell that, uh, to make that point, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but it's a good metaphor definitely for life, like the, the professor said. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks for tuning in. Mike, where can people find out more about you? I know you have uh, your coaching program website if you want to you know, give the listeners that information so they could find you and maybe contact you for coaching as well. Sure. Uh, you can go to reactivetrainingsystems.com. Uh, that's pretty much the easiest way to, to track us down. We've got a bunch of articles on there. Uh, free forum uh, has a ton of information on there. Uh, also, contact forms and you know whatever else. If you want to check out a book or a DVD or something or sign up for coaching, uh, you can do that there as well too. So a lot of resources available there, reactivetrainingsystems.com. Yeah, he's not kidding about the forum. I was glancing on it uh, the other night and there really is a ton of information on there. I mean, there's thousands of articles and really, really good stuff. So if you're interested in powerlifting training, uh, and just what Mike has to say, definitely check that out. It's definitely worth uh, visiting and definitely one of the better places to learn good quality information. So be sure to check that out. But, thanks all right, so guys, much. appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for coming on. And uh, everybody, make sure to rate us on iTunes. Uh, give us a five star review. It really helps the channel grow. And uh, visit us at newyorkmuscleradio.com for show notes and any other thing we need here. Uh, Pete, go ahead. You can do the outro, buddy. All right, guys. It's uh, Pete and Anthony, New York Muscle Radio with Mike Toucher. We're out. Enjoyed this episode of New York Muscle Radio? Make sure to hit that subscribe button, leave us a five-star review, and be sure to follow us on Facebook, New York Muscle Radio.